Hi, I'm Tom Berkland, author of An Introduction to the Policy Process and Professor of Public Policy at North Carolina State University. I hope you enjoy the book and I hope you find these videos useful. Welcome to this video about the role of the executive branch in the policy process. The executive branch, as the name suggests, executes the laws that Congress passes. In other words, it implements them. Later in the book, you'll learn about policy implementation. In this video, we'll talk about three aspects of the executive branch. First is the part of the executive branch that's really part of the political uh, side of the executive branch. That is the political appointees, the people that are appointed by the president, often with the advice and consent of the Senate, uh, into jobs in the various agencies and in the White House staff itself. The second part is then the permanent bureaucracy, which are the civil servants who don't owe their jobs to a political party or to a particular person, but who are hired based on what we call the merit system and work uh, on behalf of the government as permanent civil servants. That's different from the political appointees. Of course, the political appointees have a lot of influence over what the, the permanent civil service does. The third aspect then in this chapter and in this video is bureaucratic accountability. In other words, how do we make sure the, bureauc the bureaucrats and the bureaucracy are doing the things the, the Congress wants them to do and the public wants them to do? What do we do when members of the bureaucracy do things that a large number of people find are, are wrong or deviate from congressional con intent or from what some might claim to be the public interest. This is a fascinating aspect of American government, and I hope you enjoy the video, and I hope you find this useful in your studies of public policy. All right, so let's delve into the role of the executive branch in the policy process. What do we mean by the executive branch? Well, we mean the chief executive of a, of a government like the president or the governor in the American system uh, in the United States we have a pretty clear separation, of course, in branches between the legislative, executive, and judicial. And so the chief executive, the president, or the governor is the head of the executive branch in the federal government and in the states. At the federal level, we also have the, the staff that are uh, the political appointees. They're not all direct staff of the president, but overall about 3,000 people are appointed by the president and he has people that helps him do that. He doesn't have to know 3,000 people, but the president has people who help him identify the people who will work in the various agencies. Uh, and there are about uh, 3,000 of those. In, in recent years, people have begun to ask whether that's too many. It's, it's a real burden for the president to staff up that many positions. And perhaps that's too much political uh, appointments uh, too far down the, the organization chart in some or, in some uh, bureaucracies or some agencies. So there's a lot of debate about this, but uh, for now, I think it's probably going to stay about this number because there's some real attractive aspects about having your own people in, in the government when you get elected. Now, I consider the permanent civil service the, or the bureaucracy separately, then, uh, separately from the staff uh, because uh, they're appointed differently. They come by their jobs differently and they have a slightly different role in the system. Now, what are the president's advantages over Congress when it comes to policymaking and, and achieving its goals? Well, first, we should understand that historically considerable power has shifted towards the executive branch during important periods of our history, such as the Civil War when the president, because of his role as commander in chief, uh, had a great deal of power uh, during the war, great deal of influence over how the war was fought, uh, over how uh, captured people were to be treated. Uh, the writ of habeas corpus, which is an important legal concept about uh, the courts having to prove that there's a legitimate reason to hold you uh, in jail was suspended by the president during this time. That was a, a major exercise of executive power. Um, the New Deal era, of course, under Franklin Roosevelt is, no, is, is most notable for the incredible explosion of programs. And the book discusses this in some detail about all the government programs that were enacted in order to address the the Great Depression. And then World War II led to a whole new set of government agencies 
and, and bureaucracies that were in charge of things such as war production, uh, training personnel, or what they called back then manpower, uh, buying things from uh, defense contractors for the war, uh, ensuring that civil rights were respected in war production plants. Uh, that was a big uh, innovation in World War II. And of course, President Roosevelt uh, had a great deal of influence and power during that. And so following the Cold War, I'm sorry, the, the Second World War, you had the Cold War, which was the beginning of what a lot of people in the United States call the national security state. Uh, where national security, the defense establishment, became much bigger and more prominent than it ever had been in American history. Before World War II, the, the standing army in the United States had fewer than 100,000 men. It had a lot more after the, the Second World War. And there was a post-war demobilization, but then the Cold War kicked in, and we remobilized to a considerable extent. And uh, that lasted until the early 1990s. And even with the end of the Cold War, the end of the a permanent large defense establishment really didn't end. And the notion of the president as commander in chief during this period got, gets a lot of attention. I think it's an important question to ask yourself about whether we refer to the president as commander in chief too often now. I tend to think that sometimes we, we use that term loosely and that term is really meant in the Constitution only in the sense that the president is the commander in chief of the military. That is the military is subordinate to the executive branch, the civilian part of the executive branch, but we've gotten maybe a little too far into the notion of uh, this commander in chief. And there's a lot of other roles the president has. And that's something I'd like you to consider as you think about what the president does in our system. Of course, during the great society programs in the 1960s, there was a great deal more influence and power uh, gathered up into the executive branch uh, because the big agencies that were created to enact things like the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, anti-poverty legislation, all the things associated with Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society. But the president then has some real advantages over Congress in terms of achieving certain sort of policy goals, but it does have some disadvantages as well. But I'm gonna talk about its advantages, its power advantages. And the first of those is the president has the veto power. If the president doesn't want to uh, enact, enact a law, in other words, the president doesn't want to implement a law um, he can send a message to Congress saying, I veto this law. And the veto power is pretty formidable because it requires a two-thirds vote of both the House and the Senate to override a presidential veto. And in fact, the presidential veto is so uh, influential that oftentimes a lot of negotiation will happen between the legislative branch and senior executive branch officials to prevent the president from being presented with a bill that he'll veto. Uh, it's never a good thing from the legislative perspective to have to confront a presidential veto. And presidential over, uh, veto overrides are very rare. Presidential vetoes have become fairly rare too because Congress often will just not present a bill to Congress that he's likely to veto. So that power is is very important and is uh, it's important. I think the founders wanted the president to be able to say, I don't think that's a good idea and to require a supermajority in Congress to pass it into law. Now, another advantage the president has is, is that he's the head of a unitary branch. In other words, he's the, the leader. Uh, everybody knows the president is at the top of the executive branch and everything flows, if you will, from him. Everyone's accountable ultimately to the president. Or to put another way, as Harry Truman had a sign on his desk that said, the buck stops here, which means that he is ultimately responsible for the executive branch and, and and all its activities. But what that means is that he and his administration can speak with one voice. Whereas Congress has two houses of Congress, the House and the Senate. And even when they're held by the same party, the House and Senate may have slightly different uh, interests, slightly different priorities. And then of course there are a hundred senators and 435 members of Congress all of whom have their own ideas about what legislation should be passed and what the government should do. And so there's a lot more voices that speak about legislation, whereas we tend to look at the president as the head of the government, the, the executive branch, certainly, but he's also the head of state and head of government. And that carries important legal and symbolic weight in our system. So the president has what we call the bully pulpit. In other words, he has the ability to uh, 
attract a lot of attention. When the president wants people to know something, he can call a press conference or make a big speech, and he gets a lot of attention. The bully pulpit is a term borrowed from uh, the era of, of Theodore Roosevelt, and it's become an important part of American politics ever since. The presidential branch, the executive branch and the president's office has some informational advantages as well. He has a huge staff of people that provide information and uh, knowledge about problems and, and their potential solutions in a way that Congress may not have. Uh, Congress has something called the Government Accountability Office. It has the Congressional Research Service. But the president has the Council of Economic Advisors, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and in particular, the Office of Management and Budget is a really important part of uh, executive branch policymaking. And so he has some real advantages in, in gathering and using information to advance a, a claim that a certain policy direction should be taken. In other words, the president has a lot of agenda setting power. The president can set the agenda for the nation and if the president and Congress are in agreement with that agenda, a lot of things can happen. But the president doesn't necessarily tell Congress what to do, but the president really shapes the sort of things that are most important on the government's agenda. So he has a lot of power in agenda setting. But there's also some real constraints on the president's power. He can't force Congress to take action. He can't make them pass legislation. The sheer size of his staff can lead to two problems uh, that have been identified by scholars of presidential staffs. The first is a term called going native, which means uh, taking on the mission and goals and culture of the agency that you're appointed to run. A lot of times uh, a cabinet official or a sub cabinet official will be appointed to run a government agency, but will then begin to identify uh, more with the goals of that agency than the goals of the president. And that could be a problem if the president wants to reform that agency. Another problem is turnover. Uh, the average member of the president's cabinet, that is a cabinet secretary, uh, is in office around two years, not very long. So political appointees turn over pretty quickly. And so they don't get to know the agency as well as some of the permanent civil servants. And so their ability to run and steer the agency may be constrained. And of course, the, the other branches of government constrain the president's power. The, a lot of presidential appointments have to go through uh, the advice and consent process in the Senate. Uh, judges, as you know, have to go through the, uh, the Senate as well. Uh, the courts also serve as a check on presidential power. If the president goes too far and does something unconstitutional or illegal, the courts will have something to say about it. And the permanent bureaucracy, that is the civil service, also serves as a constraint of the president's power. So the president may be more involved in agenda setting than in selecting alternative policies. In other words, the president may tell us uh, what the most important problems are that he thinks we should be addressing, but the solutions to those problems are likely to be shaped in negotiations between the legislative and executive branch. He's not gonna have all the answers or all the power. But I wanna turn next to the bureaucracy because the bureaucracy is the biggest part of the executive branch. And I wanna talk about what we mean by agencies and bureaucrats by starting with the idea of what is a bureaucracy. And the famous sociologist Max Weber characterized a bureaucracy as, as being an organization that has a division of labor that is there are people that have certain jobs. They're, they're, they have a job description and they, they're, they're given a task to do. Uh, if you work in the government, you'll see that you're given a job description about what your task is, what your role is. And so a bureaucracy is characterized by this division of labor between people. It's it, characterized by the application of impersonal and unbiased rules. In other words, a rule that applies to you should it be a rule that applies to me. That's why it's fair uh, procedurally. In other words, the bureaucracy should treat everyone the same way. Um, if I wanna get a passport and you send in your application before I send in mine, the rules are that you would get yours first, first come, first serve, right? That's a rule. I shouldn't be able to pull strings or lean on bureaucrats to, to bend or break rules to uh, favor me. So that's an important feature of a bureaucracy. 
And another important feature of bureaucracy is staff expertise among civil servants. That is that the civil servants that work for us are experts in whatever it is they're doing. So for example, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who's been in the news a lot during the COVID pandemic is an expert on infectious diseases. He's, a, he's trained as a doctor. The federal government hires doctors, lawyers, engineers, architects, nurses, geologists, astronomers, all kinds of different people, physicists, you name the profession, there's probably a profession that works in the government because they have expertise. And a bureaucracy has obvious hierarchy. That means there are people who report to people who report to people. Now, you may notice that a bureaucracy could characterize a government agency or a private organization. Private organizations like Google or Microsoft have features of bureaucracy just like uh, the federal government. But the difference is that, that our government has civil servants. And a civil servant is a government employee who's selected on merit, not on the basis of political connections, who possesses some sort of technical knowledge. That is, they know about their job. If they're an air traffic controller, they know how to be an air traffic controller. They're not appointed politically to be an air traffic controller. And so the question is, what motivates civil servants? And I think that what motivates civil servants, and I was a civil servant for five years, what motivates people is in a large part to do the public's business, to do good things for the people. But they also have their very own opinions about what those good things are. And sometimes their opinions may clash with others in government or with the political appointees. And that's just the way our system works. Now, one of the arguments about the bureaucracy in the United States is the government is just too big. So 1999 had a 2.79 million civilian employees and a $1.8 trillion budget. And according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 4.5% of all Americans work for the government. About 2% work for the federal government. Right? That's a lot of money and a lot of people. By 2008, it had grown to a budget of over $3 trillion, slightly fewer civilian employees at the federal level, and uh, a slightly greater number working for all those levels of government, but a slightly smaller number of people working for the federal government. So there are a lot of people working in the United States government, and these are civilian non-military, uh, this doesn't count the military and uh, soldiers, sailors, marines, airmen. And so you could say, well, that's really big, but in some ways it shrunk. There's fewer people, but there's more money being spent. And the question is, how do we measure what is too big? How do we measure whether the government is too big? You've heard a lot in recent years about we must shrink government. It's gotten too big. Well, one way to measure that is by looking at overall federal outlays from 1940 to 2022, and those are estimates in 2022, in, in current and constant dollars, the dashed lines are estimates, the dotted lines are, um, are I'm sorry, that the solid lines are uh, actual numbers. And the, the one I'd like you to pay the most attention to is the solid black line. And you'll see that federal outlays in constant dollars have climbed almost every year from 1940 through now. Uh, I don't have the latest budget figures in the last couple of years, but in the next edition of the book, I'll be updating this. And that number will, will have grown as a result of things like COVID relief. But you can see there's a steady upward trend. And these are constant dollars in that black line. That means that those are dollars that are controlled for inflation. So it's not just inflation that's causing this growth. It's there are more demands being placed on government. What I find interesting is the slope of that line from about 1948 through the 1960s is pretty steady. It, it doesn't really shoot up. There's one place it really shoots up, and that's in the late 2000s, the first decade of the 2000s, where there was a big increase in federal outlays as a result of relief because of the 2008 economic, uh, the Great Recession. And uh, so the government spent a lot of money in, in that period to, to stimulate the economy. What does it say about the bureaucracy? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. It might not say that much. Next, we can look at federal government outlays as a percent of gross domestic product from 1940 to 2022. And you'll see that 
federal government outlays as a percentage of GDP shot way up during World War II, then came back down, and then have you know been fairly steady. And then in the last several decades, have bounced around twenty percent of gross domestic product. In other words, the economy has grown, and so federal spending has grown with the economy. And you might expect that uh, in a normal period, if you know, there's more people, there's more things to be done, that uh, federal government outlays might grow. So it makes a certain amount of sense that uh, the government has grown uh, with the economy. And you see a similar trend with uh, federal government outlays per capita in constant dollars. Again, a big uh, blip during World War II and a big blip during uh, the uh, 2008 economic problem, uh, the recession uh, of 2008 and into the early 2010s. So as I showed earlier, federal uh, employment hadn't really grown that much, but the question is whether the slack was picked up by state and federal government, or state and local government, I mean. And the dashed line here is state uh, government, and the solid line is local government. And you can see local government employment grew considerably during the 1980s into the 2000s, and then started to decline a little bit during the economic uh, crisis of the uh, after the 2008 uh, market crash and recession. Uh, there's been slow but steady growth in, in local government as well uh, as people place more demands on government. So it's not just the federal government that we should pay attention to. It's also state and local government. So if you compare federal employment with federal outlays, as I do on this chart, you'll see that federal government employment has remained relatively flat since 1981, but federal government outlays have, have increased a considerable extent. So what are some of the policy implications of all the things I've just shown you? First, since at least 2008, the deficits and debt have grown uh, quickly, although the pace has slowed. That said, in recent years, it's probably picked up pace again because of the COVID relief and the effects of the COVID pandemic on economic growth. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what the deficit and debt figures look like going forward. Uh, what accounts for this growth is probably a, a combination of uh, demands for certain government services and a lack of appetite for uh, tax rates on the level that the United States experienced during the 1950s and 60s. We have some of the lowest tax rates now in our history, uh, made even lower by the uh, tax reforms in the early days of the Trump administration. And some of that uh, budget deficit is a function of uh, lowering uh, tax revenues. Uh, at the same time, uh, the demands on government for various things, such as uh, uh, supports for farmers who were hurt by the trade war with China and things like that, continue. And so spending is outpacing uh, uh, revenue. And a question, of course, is whether this is a good or bad thing. And that's a subject for another day uh, that depends on your approach to what the government's role should be in stimulating the economy. One measure of growth of the government is the number of employees. And the number of employees is flat, but spending has grown very fast. And the question is, why is that? And I suspect that it's because federal government is passing, Congress is passing a lot of programs that send money to the states to implement programs at the state level. So there's not a lot of more employees that are uh, managing directly the provision of public services at the federal level, but rather the same number of employees are sending just more money to state and local governments to achieve local policy goals. So the question is, do we have big government? How do we have big government or how do we not have big government? That's a question that's up to you to decide. It's up to you as a voter and as a, and as a citizen to ask whether or not you think government is the appropriate size or if it's too big. But bureaucracy, in particular the permanent civil service, always raises the question of accountability. Bureaucrats aren't elected, but they make policy. We know this to be true. They make policy decisions. They make policy decisions every day about what the government should do. They're supposed to act in the public interest. The question is, what is the public interest? Well, they're given discretion to act in the public interest based on their expertise, their authority as a matter of law, the leadership of the agencies that 
employ the bureaucrats and the political acceptability of their exercise of, of bureaucratic discretion. So for example, the Federal Aviation Administration regulates the safety of airplanes. If they find there's a part on an airplane that's prone to fail, they'll learn about it. They'll issue something called an airworthiness directive that says all these airplanes have to fix this part. Everybody learns about it, they fix the parts, the airplanes go on flying. That's very non-controversial. But what about the discretion to stop cars near the border to search for illegal immigrants? Or what about the discretion to, uh, uh, at the local level, uh, make traffic stops? Uh, that's another form of bureaucratic discretion that we give to uh, law enforcement officials, for example. And in those cases, uh, we sometimes ask questions about whether or not they have too much choice and discretion about how they do their work. Or at the federal level, federal environmental agency employees have been given less discretion in recent years to discuss things like climate change because the administration's position on climate change differed from the, the scientific position that a lot of experts in government took. Uh, so all of these features of the environment or of the bureaucrats themselves all go into shaping the degree to which they can exercise more or less bureaucratic discretion. One of the biggest problems with bureaucratic accountability is the problem of agency capture. Agency capture is the idea that the regulated interest captures the bureaucracy and that the regulated interest then runs, if you will, the, the policy domain. So for example, uh, the airlines and uh, airplane companies like Boeing uh, are said to have captured the Federal Aviation Administration if they are able to exert their influence on the decisions that the FAA makes about safety in airplanes. And in fact, this very argument has arisen around this airplane called the 737 MAX. Uh, the 737 MAX has a design problem that uh, appears to have caused it to crash a combination of uh, software and uh, just basic design of the airplane. Uh, and that's been a big controversy. And the big controversy has been, how did the FAA allow this plane uh, to be certified to fly with this problem. And a lot of people are saying it's because the FAA uh, hasn't been providing this, the, the level of oversight over the uh, Boeing company, over airplane makers that, that they should because they're too uh, tight with Boeing. In other words, they've been captured uh, by Boeing and other aviation interests. Uh, this is an ongoing debate in uh, bureaucratic politics, bureaucratic accountability, uh, and in democratic theory. And it's something that I think you should be attentive to as you study public policy. The last thing to keep in mind is that agencies compete for attention and discretion. Agencies try to uh, uh, compete for and get the attention of members of Congress to persuade them to give them both bureaucratic discretion and to give them the resources to do the job that they want to do. People that run bureaucracies, even civil servants, have a sense of mission and purpose, and they want to pursue their mission, and they want to fulfill their purpose because they believe it's in the public interest to do so. Thanks for watching this video. As always, I really enjoy hearing from students and teachers about the book and about public policy. Feel free to reach out to me at tom at tomberkland.com or visit my website, tomberkland.com. Thanks again for watching.